All right, welcome everybody to the to my eye lecture. Um, today it's a pleasure to have Andrea um, Tayasaki <laughs> with us. And I, I, I practice a little bit to pronounce your name. Um, and of course, everybody knows Andrea. Um, he's he's a stunning star in the in the research community, both in computer vision, graphics, and machine learning. Um, today he's going to talk about neural fields beyond novel field synthesis. Um, Andrea is currently an associate professor at Simon Fraser University, where he holds the Visual Computing Research Chair within the School of Computer Science. He's also a part-time research scientist at Google Brain in Toronto, and he's also an associate professor by status in the Computer Science Department at the University of Toronto. He received his PhD at SFU. He did a postdoc at EPFL, and you know, after all his stations, he went back basically to his alma mater. And yeah, I think it's probably hard to to, to miss most of his works. My, my PhD students told me recently, Andrea is Twitter famous. <laughs> and um, that's with a lot of grounding because he has done really exceptional work, especially in neural fields and in nerve related works. And um, I looked at his website. I think there were probably like 20, 30 papers right now around in this area. So without a doubt, he's one of the leading stars driving the field forward. And I'm extremely happy and fortunate to have him here today in our lecture series. Um, and with that, we'll be looking forward to seeing what you have to talk about today. Thanks, Matthias, for the introduction. Um, yeah, so today I wanted to talk about neural fields, and I guess the emphasis here on my title is uh, going beyond novel view synthesis. Uh, what I mean by that uh, is that I want to go beyond because uh, if you have noticed, industry has actually caught on, and this is actually the Google CEO that actually promises uh, to have neural fields deployed in, in product in the coming year. And this is one of our papers, Urban Regions Fields, compound with uh, one of uh, John Barron's team's group paper uh, on, uh, on MIP Nerve360. So why do we want to move beyond novel view synthesis? So NERF has allowed us to take collections of images, uh, which are calibrated, and then use volume rendering to then train an underlying 3D representation that can, gener can, can generate new views of a scene from a, a test point of view. And these reconstructions are, or the training of these models is done by actually doing photometric reconstruction, right? So we have this model right here, this will be the NERF model. And we simply ask that a particular pixel, which corresponds to our A, as you can see right here, reproduces the color in the ground truth training image. Now, this is the volumetric integral. And one thing that I like to do whenever I talk about radiance field is actually notice that this integral as made is compounded of two different parts, right? So if you, recast this integral right here in this form, you can see that there is actually a function that is only a function of position. Although I'm giving you a slight lie and toward, late toward the talk, I'll explain to you why. And the second term is only about appearance, right? Because it's a function of position as well as view direction, which is necessary to train radiance fields or view dependent radiance fields. So let's consider a second, the problem space that uh, NERP lives in, right? So most of the literature I would argue that focuses around novel view synthesis, right? So how to take a scene, train it from a set of images, and then render it, like you see here in the bottom left, from a new viewpoint. But this is now what computer vision is, right? Like computer vision mostly wants to do understanding. We want to do things like segmentation, classification, and so on. And what about photogrammetry and sensor fusion and all of these other applications of bringing different sources of, of supervision into a common ground? Like this is also not, was not covered very much. And what about computer graphics? Computer graphics is about interactive control. And can we get more of this? Can we get more of what HyperNerf has actually teased in terms of giving controllability to this neural fields model? Another angle of the problem space is uh, knowledge about the camera, right? Um, most of the literature up to this point, although many more papers are coming up in recent times, focus on the known camera setup. And what I mean by that is that you assume that the cameras are hopefully perfectly calibrated for some for something like Colmap, uh, you assume that you have multiple images of the exactly the same scene and nothing has moved in between two different frames. And then, then the images that you captured were the fixed exposure, fixed white balance, fixed ISO, and so on, so that you can then use um, photometric consistency to train these models. And so if you have something like this, uh, where each of these images, perhaps, of the same scene is captured under different exposure, then your model uh, will not look really good at all, right? And if I have no camera calibration, what do you do? Can you still actually train a NERF model? So these are all angles that are not completely covered in the in the NERF domain. 
And finally, um, I would say that the other axis of, of um, specialization of papers that have been recently appearing is that a lot, a lot of papers focus on the overfeeding regimes, right? And what I mean by that is single scenes. You might have tens or hundreds of images, but if it's, a, it's of a single scene. And so my, my question is, what happens if you only have one image of a scene, of each scene available? So for example, here on the left, top left, we have a celebe. And in this case, that's exactly the domain we're in. We have a single image of a person. A person in this case is a scene, and we never see the same person again, potentially, right? Can we still learn something? Can we learn that uh, a 2D picture of a person is actually a projection of an underlying 3D model? And the other example of generalization that I can give you is uh, the one uh, of uh, generalization to new scenes and understanding. So for example, if I give you pairs of images and semantic maps, can I now take a large collection of images and construct a NERF model that you can see right here, and then understand that there's a mapping in between the geometry learned from the NERF model and the signal that, the semantic signal of the scene, right? So how can I learn this mapping in a generalizable fashion? So these are three angles that I want to cover today. And I'm gonna cover uh, this problem starting from uh, 3D morphology models. So starting from faces, as I hinted a couple of seconds ago. So there was this uh, extremely famous paper, 3MM, 3 morphological models, the Blands and Vetter model. Uh, there is actually a, a library that many people license uh, from this author. It's a secret of 99 paper, right? And uh, the way in which this model works is that you collect uh, a large data set using uh, LIDAR uh, or depth scanner and so on. So you collect a large collection of these signals and then you fit to all of these signals a uh, consistent topologically topologically consistent mesh models. And from this signal, you can then build a PCA model that allows you to do things like this, where a new expression can be built from the natural expression of a person plus a linear combination of offsets, okay? And this can only be done for, um, for facial deformation like you see right here, but it can also be done for identity. Although here I'm just uh, giving you an example of deformation. And so the question is, do we really need this intermediate layer? Do we really need to have these uh, ground through that signals to have this model. And by the way, this model is using most facial trackers that you have in production right now, right? So, because you want to learn the underlying structure of, uh, of faces before you uh, trying to do inference of 3D from natural images, from a single image in particular. So can we learn these models, these uh, um, statistical model of faces without relying on 3D dip sensors and uh, classical techniques like mesh registration and so on, right? And that's exactly what the purpose of this project was. This is a lull nerf, learn from one look. Uh, it was presented at CBPR this year. And the idea is that we want to lift 3D out of 2D, okay? And we do this by relying on a large collection of 2D images. In this case, it was Celebrity HQ. And we want to avoid relying on GANs, right? Yes, GANs give you amazing results, able to synthesize very fine scale um, details. But here we wanted to achieve something like you saw in the previous case, right? We really care about the hair. We want to have a very good statistical model of what the faces are, and we want to lift it out of, uh, of natural images. So we want extremely high quality geometry, like the one you can see right here. This is actually one of the output from our model. So how do we do it? Like one way is using GANs, and PyGAN is an example of this. And later on, I will show you a couple of uh, limitations, and our focus is on geometry. And so what we did in this paper is actually uh, at the time, I guess CodeNerf uh, was submitted roughly at the same time, uh, so it's parallel work. Uh, but what we do is actually we build a NERF model that is not overfitting to a single scene, but is rather a conditioned NERF model. And what I mean is that the, the model to render a particular image, uh, which will be in the output of this block, does not only depend on the camera uh, parameterization, so on the parameterization of rays that generate the camera or to generate the image that are underlying the camera, but it also depends on the latent, on a latent code Z. And what we do is that each identity in this data set will be associated with its own latent code Z, right? And so the problem becomes uh, the one of training a conditional NERF model in such a way that at test time, given a single image of uh, an, a person, I can actually extract the underlying 3D representation like you can see right here, okay? And there's no GANs involved here. So this is fully just a uh, conditional NERF model training. So what do we do? So we train an auto decoder. Uh, it's a popular architecture also known as uh, generically latent optimization, uh, but for a NERF model. And we train on a data set of single view images, right? So there's only one photo of each person in this data set. Uh, 
So if you do that and you do nothing else, this is what happens. So the first column is what happens. Uh, from the training viewpoint, you know, it still looks like kind of like a person. But if you then take this nerve model and then you rotate it 30, 45 degrees to the side, this is actually what a test view looks like. Okay. Basically, there was a simple um, flatland interpretation of your results because there is no reason for a conditional nerve model training in an auto decoder fashion to have 3D content emerge, right? So nerve can cheat extremely well, just like all neural networks. And so what we do is that we rely on a pre-trained key point estimator, like the one you can see right here. And this is needed because once you have an image in the data set that has been observed from a grazing angle like this one, the key points that are extracted from these images are in semantic correspondences with other key points in, uh, in REST pose. And this allows us to get a rough estimate of camera pose. And to be honest, the result that we achieved uh, by this simple trick uh, kind of surprised me because if you consider nerve trained in the, in the single scene setting, you really need to have extremely precise camera poses. Otherwise you either get blurry results or what is called like floater artifact in the environment. While in this setting, we were able to just get by with five key points extracted from a pre-trained key point extractor for faces. And this was enough to actually um, get out of this flat land mode collapse of the model that you can see right here. By the way, these images are a little bit uh, um, smoother and low for, lower frequency. They were done in the last few hours before uh, last year deadlines for CBPR. And then finally, the third thing is that um, Celebe, which contains these single view images, has uh, an additional inductive bias, which is that most of the faces that are in the data set have been acquired with Pareto frontal uh, captures, which means that the camera was looking almost always straight down the face, right? So there were not a lot of extreme viewpoints like looking at a face from 90 degrees to the side. And what this causes, you can actually squint a little bit right here. I wish I had an animation of this, but essentially what happens is that you have a bit of blur along the typical Z axis of the frontal of the frontal view. The model gets confused because there's no reason for the model to use hard surfaces to explain faces in a celebrity data set. You can actually use semi-transparent surfaces, semi-transparent objects to model uh, the skin of the face, for example. And so what we did is that now going back to the volumetric integral that I mentioned earlier, what we did is that we noticed that this term right here, if this term represents geometry, then we can impose priors on this term. Sorry, I keep hearing a notification, but I cannot see. Um, is there a chat? Let me see. All right, no. Um, I opened the Zoom chat in case anybody has any questions, by the way. So you can just write them there and have it here on my side. And so we can take this uh, term WX and think of it as the geometry of the system. And we can say that this problem of having these blurry faces was caused by the fact that there was no prior imposed on the geometric structure of the reconstruction, right? So human faces are made of hard surfaces, not of uh, smoke or clouds. And so this function needs to be able to represent um, hard surfaces in most cases. If a face model like the one that I showed you here is what I'm trying to build, okay? And so what we did is that you can actually add a simple loss, which basically says that, well, this function uh, represents actually the, the likelihood of a point uh, in space contributing to the color of a particular ray, right? And so what you can do is that you can impose a prior that says that, well, in a typical uh, celebe uh, data set, I'm looking straight down at faces. And if I'm focusing on the facial mask of the person, there is only two things that can happen, either the array intersect the faces, and then this function w should be valued at one. So there's a peak of likelihood around one, or the array is crossing empty space because it's about to reach the face, and therefore the function w should have a peak of likelihood around zero. And so by imposing a, a simple prior in this form, you can actually obtain much higher quality results. And so this is a general recipe uh, to get rid of floaters uh, within the environment, by the way. And that's it. So these are actually the only two tricks used by the paper. Well, three. Uh, you have an outer decoder, so you have a conditional nerve model. You give rough camera poses by seeding it with a pre-trained uh, key point extractor where key points not are in semantic correspondence. And three, you add a prior over what the geometry of the nerve model looks like. And that's it. And so now uh, what you can do with this model is actually feeding new identities. And here we see the comparison that I promised you with respect uh, to PyGAN. So both models have been trained on Celebe, although um, PyGAN kind of choked uh, at a lower resolution while Lulnerf was able to be able to use much higher uh, resolution images. 
And then we tested it on a different data set, right? So to test generalization. So we were testing on FFHQ faces and here are actually the reconstruction produced by the model. So if you notice for, let's say simple uh, reconstruction. So remember, we're trying to extract the 3D model underlying these images. So these are re-renderings of that 3D model. So if there is Pareto frontal images, you can see that all models do more or less equally, equally good. We learn are doing a little bit better just because we were trained on high resolution images. But if you notice as we move from left to right, we are challenging more and more the model with angles that are out of distribution, right? So this image is not very common within Celebe. And so whenever you're trying to optimize for the underlying 3D model that reproduces this image within a GAN space, you get rather suboptimal results. And what I find interesting is that compared to the complexity of the architecture of a compound GAN plus NERF model, this model that we have is relatively simple to use, which I think is actually the, um, the, the main characteristics of, of the work that we have. That we get good results, but most importantly, that the technical solution that we adopted is, is really, really simple and, and, and clean to use. And of course, the, the quantitative results confirm this finding across the entire data set, just to confirm that these are not cherry-picked results. So this is how you fit to new identities. Uh, but now you can ask what's next. Okay, fine. If uh, we want to move away from nerve models that are in the overfitting regime, then we want to have conditional nerve models, right? So um, can we learn, for example, a high fidelity facial model from just images in the wild? This means that uh, the conditional nerve model needs to be extremely powerful, even more powerful than the one that we used and perhaps able to capture fine grain details like hair and, and non-volumetric effects even, right? And other questions are, can the camera codes be learned in the loop so that I don't have to rely on a pre-trained um, pre key point detector? Or can we give more direct control over what the model has learned? In this case, notice that I was only focusing on the um, identity, not on the facial expression. Can, can controllers for facial expressions be learned from images in the wild rather than relying on coupling traditional systems uh, with natural images. And finally, which I think is something I want to give you a hint because we have a paper in this area as well, are all, um, all MLP architectures really the way to approach the problem. And here I'm giving you a single slide hint to this and the answer is no. So if you've worked in this area for a while, you know that there is several classical ways of uh, conditioning nerve model. The most popular one perhaps is the concatenation where you have a neural field, which means that you have a coordinate and an input that produces some signal in output. And then to make it a conditional neural field, what you do is that you concatenate to the coordinate or its positional encoding, some latent code Z, right? And then you feed that to an MLP to produce your output. There has also been hyper network models, which in the neural fields community were introduced by Sitzman in C representation networks, where instead of having to re-execute the part of the MLP that touched the code Z, you pre-cache that execution by having a, an hyper network that generates the weights of this MLP. So that, as you can see, like you only execute once this network for the entire code Z, you generate the weights W of this MLP, and now every point just execute the, the weight coordinate uh, multiplications to generate the output. But it turns out that neither of these two solutions are actually the optimal one. And recently we did a, a thorough analysis on whether there exist other architectures to generalize, to generate conditional neural fields. And here I'm not talking about the grid-based architectures. We're trying to identify architectures that can scale to high dimensions without suffering the curse of dimensionality. And sadly, well, it's a running joke. Sadly, sadly transformers win again. And a tension in between a coordinate network and a set latent representation turn out to be actually a more effective way uh, to represent uh, conditional re uh, radiance fields in a, in a range of applications, not even a single one. So I invite you to read this paper that was recently accepted to TMLR uh, 2023, if you want to learn a little bit more about this. All right, so this is closes like one first chapter of what I present, what wanted to present to you today, which was on the conditional neural field. Uh, and now we have a way of generating these models, for example, from a single image, I can lift the 3D model behind um, one of the pictures that is in your photo library, right? But now how do I serve it, right? So these nerve models are not only relatively slow to train or used to be relatively slow to train, but they're also relatively painful to serve. So I can render a video, of course, I can pre-render a video then uh, serve the video, but this is a little bit um, 
how can I say, um, not what we want, right? Like we would like to be able to interactively uh, interact with the scene. And so what we can do is that we can do fast training now, right? So we can rely on the observation that storing everything in an MLP was perhaps not the best idea. And we can have a hybrid representations that have a neural component, a small MLP, coupled with grid representations, which amortize um, sparse storage of properties, and then use interpolation to then generate uh, or train NERF models extremely efficiently, right? So this is the amazing paper from uh, Thomas Muller from NVIDIA Instant NGP that has kind of revolutionized this, this field in the last uh, in the last year. And uh, for fast rendering, there is many solutions, right? So one first solution is to actually try to do inverse uh, physically based rendering. So what I can do is that I can take a collection of images and now rather than training a NERF model, I can instead try to invert physics. And by inverting physics, it means that you have to recover uh, the geometry perhaps a triangular mesh or a polygonal mesh or a tet mesh like the one you can see right here. Uh, you want to reverse engineer the material, the BRDF, uh, the spatially variant BRDF of the model, and you want to reverse engineer the illumination perhaps so that you can change the illumination of the model and serve it in a new, in a new scene. And these are two really nice pieces of works, one from NVIDIA, the other one from Tübingen um, that target this problem. However, up to now, I've not seen a uh, result in this field that, that don't have some form of pitfall. And often when you work in this mode, you're often um, forced to work in the in the hard surface setting in the sense that because you have in a normal super eight, you typically made the assumption of using with a surface and therefore volumetric effects are not particularly um, easy to represent in this model. And so um, there's other ways of doing this, right? Nobody says that you should be using a surface. You can still use a volumetric model. And I think 2021, I guess people were working in this in 2020, but 2021 was the uh, the hot topic was accelerating nerf rendering, right? So these are actually four papers appearing roughly at the same time uh, in uh, in the literature. Fast nerf, kilo nerf, don't nerf, fast nerf kind of touched all the same areas. But the issue is that uh, I put air quotes around solution, as you can see up here, and the reason is that if you take some of these models and you try to open them up either on your cell phone or your tablet, this is what might happen, right? Um, you might have an incompatibility of the hardware because the, the application needs a, a special uh, execution of shaders uh, to do its job, or perhaps uh, the model doesn't fit in memory or WebGL compatibility make it impossible to support it. Actually, it's the other way around. This was for memory and this was for incompatibility. And today I want to show you a solution to this problem. So here is a model that rendered across all four these different devices using just a web WebGL renderer, right? So how is that possible? And the performance is actually quite good. If you use one of the latest generation iPhones, I've never seen it go beyond 60 FPS for most of the classical nerve scenes. So how does it work? Well, the idea is actually uh, leverage uh, an idea that um, actually Matthias and some of his colleagues uh, Justus, Matthias, and somebody else is the middle author, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite, most favorite paper from SIGGRAPH 2019, and it was deferred neural rendering. So the idea was that if you get your geometry right, and if you can get your UV parameterization of some solid geometry right, what you can do is that you can use that UV parameterization to fetch features within the neural textures and render a, a feature image, right? And as far as you can do this process, well, then the problem of generating a natural image becomes the one of learning a neural deferred renderer, which is this block in between that converts uh, an image of features into an image of uh, view dependent colors, perhaps, right? I forgot if there was the view dependent uh, portion in this paper, but it doesn't really make a difference. And this idea was already used in Snurg, right? So Snurg uh, performed exactly this task. It ran a sparse volume rendering using this uh, 3D sparse texture atlas to then render uh, information along array. And then once it was in screen space, use this tiny deferral neural renderer to convert the, the color, sorry, the, the feature in, uh, in final color space. Yes. And what we, how we extended these, uh, these two papers, which are the most relevant to the discussion today is by realizing that, uh, well, in most hardware, in most commercial hardware, the hardware is actually specialized to render triangles. It's not really specialized to render uh, volume rendering, right? So you need special compatibility for that. And often most of these papers that I showed you a couple of seconds ago, these ones, 
require you to actually write custom CUDA kernels to execute these operations, which is not possible in a, in a consumer uh, level um, cell phone, right? But triangle soups can be rendered very efficiently in a, in a consumer device, in a modern consumer device. So in terms of compatibility, a triangle soup is actually extremely good. And in terms of speed is also very good because GPUs in consumer hardware are designed to render triangles fast and resolve occlusions via depth buffering very efficiently. And finally, in terms of memory, while uh, a paper like SNR down here, this is actually a 3D texture atlas right here, or a volumetric texture atlas, but meshes have 2D texture atlases. So they are just natively much smaller in terms of um, employed memory than, than 3D texture atlases. And so the idea is to use a triangle soup, but I would like you to know that this triangle soup doesn't have to be particularly precise. Here you can see the triangle soup that we used to render this image. Right, so how is that possible that from this triangle soup, I get an image that looks as good as this? And later I will show you also videos of this, um, and you will not be able to tell that this came from uh, a mesh that looks this bad. So the idea is to employ again um, the fur neural rendering, right? So the idea is to have uh, optimize a triangle soup, so we get a rough proxy geometry for the model that we want to render. Okay, and I call it a soup rather than a triangle mesh because this thing is not a manifold in any shape or form. It's actually a three manifold, um, but that's a technicality. A two manifold is what you would call a surface in classical graphics. This thing is not a surface, right? Or, or yeah, anyway, um, in some sense it's a surface, but uh, let's not go there. And then what you do is that you triangle, you couple this polygonal mesh with a neural texture, right? Or with a texture map. And here, because we have a triangle soup and therefore we cannot flatten the triangle soup down to an image space with low distortion, what we use is that we use PTEC, right, which was a, a technique proposed by Disney a few years ago, where basically every triangle or quad get parameterized to a, a fixed set of pixels in a texture map. So you will have a map in between a quad right here and a quad right here, okay? So here will be like a quad soup, but I'm gonna use triangle and quad in a, in a swappable way. And the other thing that we do is that once you have this parameterization, which is easy to compute, we store two things. We store features. And the reason for which we store features is that later we will convert these uh, image buffer of features into colors. But we also store opacity. And why? Um, the reason is because, as you can see, this mesh doesn't is not a particularly good fit to this surface that I want to render, right? But what we do is that what you can do is that you can take a triangle, you can rasterize it to screen space, and then within the texture, you can store a binary flags that tells you where a particular fragment or the pixel that can render from that uh, triangle should be discarded or not. And so you, what you can do is that you can discard the shell of or these little wings of vertices of triangles right here that will create this jagged boundary in actually obtaining the, the proper boundary of, of the model that you can see right here. And the step to produce this frame buffer of feature is just standard rasterization, right? The generation of these two models is learning, but at test time, generating this frame buffer of images is just taking a polygonal mesh with a particularly uh, prepared texture map and then just rendering to screen space without any uh, extra bells and whistles, right? So that's stage one. And then stage two is nothing else than implementing a small MLP that converts each uh, pixel in the frame buffer, so in the image that the renderer has generated, from this high dimensional feature space, which is, well, high dimensional is maybe an overstatement. It's it's eight dimensional feature space here visualized with PCA back to the to the final color that that pixel should have. And also, by the way, integrating view dependent, uh, view dependent effects. Uh, so we concatenate uh, view dependence um, together with the feature in the input to the MLP. And so this guy right here, it stands for a small MLP that acts again as a neural defer deferral rendering shader, right? And this can be implemented efficiently in WebGL, uh, thanks to, to Peter Hedman for, for showing how's, uh, how that is possible with Zenerg. So we reuse part of his code right here. And the outcome of this is, uh, is basically summarized by the title of this slide, right? So the uh, much faster, but the quality of the results is just as good compared to previous, uh, previous pipelines. This is an old phone. Uh, it's a 30 FPS, as I said. On a on a modern phone, you hit um, you hit 60 FPS solid. All right. So um, now we have a way of we have a way of training models in a generalizable way, at least in a, in a limited context of phase, like I showed you in the first part of the talk. 
we have a way of um, of uh, serving these models uh, at scale because now these models um, can be opened by any phone. Actually, I would invite you to um, kill your your data plan and open this link where you can actually find live um, live demos for the model that you're seeing right now on screen. And the other question that I want to ask you today is now that we have a way of creating these models at scale and serving them at scale, right? So training time went from taking a day or two to taking uh, a few seconds or a few minutes at worst. We have found ways of generating larger scale models and model um, larger environments. I would invite you to take a look at the multi-nerve code base right here. They have amazing visual fidelity. We can do it from 2D images alone, and we can do it from millions of scenes. We will be able soon to be able to do it from millions of scenes. And so the question becomes, once this third point will come in, what do we do, right? Is Nerve just gonna be a toolbox that you take to just uh, re-render scenes like you see right here? Or do you want to do something more? Do you actually want to do computer vision? And so this is actually the question that I'm asking you today, and I will show you one of the answers that I have. And so the idea is that if you look at these equation right here that I showed you earlier, the thing or represents NERF as a composition of geometry, although in this volumetric uh, way of looking at things and appearance, can we design a toolbox that work on models composed like this, right? And what does this toolbox look like? Well, the answer to that is that when polygonal meshes appeared at the end of the last century, after they appeared, we spent roughly three decades, right? From the 90s to today, actually developing infrastructure for processing, manipulating, deforming, editing, generating polygonal meshes, right? And so this means that now if we have access to millions of scenes that can be generated from three images alone, how, what's that toolbox? Is the only thing that we have uh, at, our, uh, at our availability converting one of these NERF models back down to a mesh and then using the mesh uh, editing toolbox and then perhaps go back to a NERF model? Or is there some better toolbox that allows us to manipulate, edit, and, and integrate these scenes? And so that's actually what I'm focused today. And so we did one uh, piece of work um, and here uh, I'm gonna present to you today neural semantic fields, right? So the premise of this work is the following, is that if you look in terms of understanding the content of a scene, and if you look back uh, in time, um, I'm going to show you these three examples, right? So you have problems that attempted to convert sequences, right? So um, sequence to sequence models like LSTM transformers were designed to take uh, a collection of tokens corresponding to words and perhaps perform translation or understanding, right? Um, you have the second class of problems, which are image to image uh, transition pipelines, right? So this is the fully convolutional network uh, UNETs um, kind of class of models that took an image um, that was just perhaps uh, just a grayscale image of something and converted that image into the semantic classes. Uh, so the content of the image could be semantics, uh, instances, panoptic, whatever you want. Then we had models uh, that perform cloud to cloud translation, right? So we have a point cloud, perhaps with colors and input, Thank Matthias uh, and Angela for uh, for Scannet, by the way. Just a shout out to the to the good work uh, the, the TOM uh, group has done. And then we can convert uh, these into the semantic um, categories of each point. And here we find point net and point net plus plus. And so if you notice, and you zoom out a second, forget about what the underlying gray arrow here is for a second, but you see that there is a trend, right? So we started from I mean signals, and then we developed architecture for signal to signal translation. We have sequence to sequence, image to image, cloud to cloud. And now we're gonna start entering the domain of millions of nerve scenes acquired. And so the question becomes, if nerve is a neural field, what is a field to field translation network? Can we have networks that take a field in input? This is actually a rendering of a nerve model. And can we generate a field of something else in output? And I'm gonna follow the same pattern that I had below, above, and I'm gonna go from a raw representation of the signals. So in this case, it's just the radiance and density, and I want to convert it to output semantic maps. Okay, so how do we do it? So I'm gonna give you the uh, general recipe uh, for field-to-field -field translation. Uh, well, it's a field, right? So a field, it means a mapping in between a point in space uh, from the physics interpretation to a quantity in, uh, in the output, right? It could be density, volume, viscosity, whatever, like some quantity in output, right? And so because it's a field, and because perhaps this field is stored in a neural network, 
the only thing that you can do is probe the field. And here I'm representing a field. I, I tried to look for something better and maybe generate one with, with Imogen. I failed, and so I just use a vignette in this case. Um, so because it's a field, the only thing you can do is probe it. And here, that's actually what I am um, showing you right here. What I can do is that I have my field F, and then I scatter a collection of samples Xn in space, and I probe the value of a function in space. Keep in mind, I'm being completely general with respect to what the actual function is. I'm just probing a function, and then I'm storing it in a point cloud, essentially. The second thing that I do is that I want to reason about the field, right? And uh, we have learned from many years of, uh, of, uh, of deep learning that local reasoning is extremely important, is the success, of, uh, is the success story of convolutional neural networks. And local reasoning uh, is based on uh, equivariance. So right? we want to make decisions by analyzing the local neighborhood of a particular point cloud. Of course, yes, global reasoning is also important, but we started from local right here. And so what we can do is that we can take a point, right? One of the sample points that we had in the input, sorry, this one, and we can reason about the other values of the field in its neighborhood to compute a feature, right? So we aggregate the local knowledge of the model around this point into this feature Fn. And there is a one-to-one -one corresponding in this case in between the probe point and the feature that I go, um, that I go to uh, store uh, the, the local understanding. And here, this you think of it as being like, um, whatever network that things takes a collection of points in space and analyzes them and produces some uh, feature in output, right? It can be your Minkowski net, it can be your sparse unit, it can be whatever you want, your point net or point net plus plus. And finally, remember this is a field to field. So the input of the pipeline is a field, the output of the pipeline is a field. And so what we need to do is that we need to find a way of querying the field anywhere. So to generate the field at any position in output space. So notice this query point uh, is not one of my probes. Uh, I put it somewhere else that I want to probe the quantity. In this case, for example, I wanted to understand that my cloud was made of three bumps. I don't know, it's a toy uh, pretext uh, task. And here, what I can do is that I can take uh, the point. I can query, for example, nearby features, right? So the one that this network has produced right here. And I can then decode the value of the output field at this point in space, right? So this decoder will be shared uh, for every query point in the environment. And it will take an input the query point Q, this position in space, as well as the collection of features produced by this intermediate network. Okay, it's a very generic recipe, right? There's nothing, um, yeah, you can plug it into whatever you want in input. Uh, it could be nerve densities, could be nerve radiances, and you can plug it into whatever you want in output as far as the output is also a field. And so what we did is that uh, we applied this way of formulating the problem to NERF. And that's why it's called the neural semantic fields, kind of like a play on words on neural radiance fields. And uh, um, yeah, so we replaced the, the radiance with semantic right here, right? And the, the purpose for which we want to do this is that we want to distill 3D semantics, right? So this is not 2D semantics. We're not taking an image and converting that image to an image containing the semantic class of its pixels. We want to learn the 3D semantics in space. We want to be able to probe a point in space and tell you what is the class of that point in space. And we want to do that by supervision only from 2D images, right? Because we have a lot of 2D images available and they're not hard to annotate. 3D annotation of data is painful, don't go there, TLDR. The second thing that we want to do is that we want to achieve generalization, right? And we want to do 3D generalization. And I want to say this and highlight it because there is another paper in this realm uh, that scooped us, open parenthesis, close parenthesis, which was semantic nerve. And semantic nerve does 2D generalization, right? So what semantic nerve does is that the generalization power of semantic nerve is actually in the image encoder. And semantic nerve fuses the generalization of the image encoder in a single consistent representation. They are completely orthogonal techniques. So what you could do is that you could take an ESF compounded with semantic nerve and it will be a new paper if you want, right? But they're completely going in different direction. Generalization from 3D versus generalization in 2D. And finally, we want to do this generalization across different things. We want to generalize across viewpoints. That's a classical nerve workload. We want to generalize across objects. And what I mean by the instances of objects in the same class, and we want to generalize across scenes, right? So. What I mean by that is that if we acquire with a nerve model I've seen, I've never seen before, I want to be able to understand the semantic content of the scene, okay? And this is possible, I'm gonna show you how now. 
So the idea is going back to a nerve model. The reason for which this uh, block here is gray is because we don't backprop stuff with respect to the gray's gray model, which means that we run nerve, which at the time was painfully slow. Uh, it was before instant NGP, uh, planoxels, DVGO, and all these other ones came out. And so we cache it, we store the neural field in an MLP, and then leave it on disk. And then what we can do is that we can now try to achieve these three tasks reasoning about a field. And the field that we decided to work on for reasoning, specifically because there was also semantic nerve already in the, in, the, in the literature, was to actually reason from the geometry representation, right? Why? Because semantic nerve, because generalization happens in 2D in image space, exploits mostly appearance to perform generalization. And what we wanted to do in ESF was to actually focus on the 3D substrate. So can we understand the content of the scene by only looking at the 3D information, which is basically the same thing that uh, pipelines relying on depth scanners and point cloud semantic um, achieved back in the day. So we want to replace basically uh, the depth sensor with a nerve model, right? That's what's happening right here. And so that's what we do is that we take the volume entering from the volume rendering from nerve and we work on these function. In particular, we work on the geometry. So in this case, we are using density. Later on, I'm going to tell you why we made a mistake about a year ago, and I'm going to show you uh, how to fix it. But let's say that you use that F is the density model of a nerve model. So it's a mapping in between a point in space and a positive value, unbounded positive value. And so what we want to do is that we want to generate this uh, F to F, field to field, or function to function conversion network that takes a function, which is the density, and generates a function which is the semantic structure of a scene, right? That, uh, and this, again, I'm just rendering it here. Uh, but what I'm saying is that this is a function in space, right? It's a mapping in between a 3D point and the class of that 3D point. And on top of that, we want to be able to do that only from supervising the training of this guy right here, only with uh, image level uh, supervision. So that's a necessary condition. Yeah, I forgot this animation was popping up. Anyway, so how do we do it? So remember the um, recipe for field-to-field -field translation I gave you. Point number one, we probe the function. Point number two, we reason about the function. Point number three, we generate a new function of a point in space that we want to have. And the recipe that we follow in this seminal paper was to actually take by far the simplest setup that you could have, right? So we took a vanilla nerve model, which is why later on the quality of the rendering from the nerve side don't look that great. Um, you can ask me a question in private about why. Um, generate the density function, right? And then what we do is that we probe the function. What's the simplest way of probing a function? Well, that's actually the reason for which we do that is because of this middle layer. I'm going to get to it in a second. But the easiest way to probe a function is probing it within the acquisition volume with a regular grid, right? And so what we do is that we sample at regular interval the density field to get a um, grid of density values. Then, now that we have a density grid, these are our probes, right? Where we measure field. Second thing that we want to do is that we want to reason about the function in an equivariant fashion. If the sampling of my points is a regular grid, dense in this case, we didn't do anything sparse in this particular paper, was the easiest way of doing 3D reasoning in a translational equivariant fashion is a unit, it's a 3D unit. And so this middle layer is a 3D unit that converts density a density grid into a feature grid. Very simple, right? So as I said, reason about the function, the simplest solution is a 3D unit. And on the output layer, what we do is that at any point in space, like in either of these uh, four dots that we later on will belong to array, we want to be able to generate a function, right? And well, now it's popular. Instant NGP made it super popular. Uh, at the time, it was not so popular. Uh, it was from neural sparse voxel field, the idea and from other more classical papers in graphics. And what we do is that at each of these red points, we generate the uh, value of the, of the field by first trilinearly interpolating the features in the surrounding cube of, uh, of, um, of voxel, sorry, the vertices of the surrounding voxel. And then uh, we pass uh, the output of the interpolation to an MLP to then generate the output semantic class of that particular point, right? So this is the semantic class of a point in space X. And these generate a function in space, right? There is still uh, one last uh, bit to what we want to do is 
how do we actually supervise this thing? Well, now what I can do, as uh, shown to you by the skip connection right here, I can recycle again the density function of an Earth model, and I can bring it to the output layer, and then I can compound the density model together, of course, with transmittance, and together with the output semantic class to then volume render the semantic class in 2D from a particular viewpoint. And here is where we have a semantic supervision that sends gradient back to this MLP and this UNet. And that's it. We do not send gradients back to NERF. NERF is being used as a photogrammetry pipeline that given a collection of images of complex scenes generates the underlying 3D representation of the scene. All right, so back in the days, um, you know, NERF took a, a day to train and even acquiring a scene was pretty painful. Uh, so what we did is that we actually relied on synthetic data to try out this idea. So this is Kubrick, it was a paper uh, last year at CVPR, and in about 30 lines of code, you can generate videos that look like this with all sorts of goodies, from an editable Blender file for easy prototyping to all sort of um, supervision uh, that you want to use for your practical task. We had a couple, of, I think it was 13 or 14 applications uh, from a number of different groups around the world. Um, and in this case, we focused on the semantic bit, right? So we could synthesize randomly generated scenes in Blender, render them from a particular camera viewpoint with random illuminations, and then generate semantic mask together with color images in, in ground truth. And what we did is that we generated uh, data sets of increasing complexity uh, from something that looks like the clever data set with a K that stands for Kubrick, um, that looks like this, to more and more complex scenes that you see on the right. And we train NERF on it. So if you train NERF on this model, uh, you can see the novel view synthesis of the NERF model here in the first column. You can see the underlying uh, or a visualization of the underlying density model in the middle column. And here is uh, the result of supervising um, the translation network on training scenes using a um, few shot semantic maps, right? So as you notice, by the way, most of the problems, even in training signal, are not due to the translation network. They're actually due to the fact that we were using a now completely obsolete NERF model, right? So you see this cloudy effect. This is just because uh, of the way in which the scene was built. And, and uh, uh, there is much better NERF models that you can use right now to obtain it. And here is the performance of the test scenes. It's minus some mistakes, which are really reasonable. And we discussed them in the paper. It works as advertised. And this gives the hope that if we acquire millions of scenes and we annotate a few images for each of these scenes, then now we can, for a new scene that has been acquired and optimized through NERF, we can actually use the underlying trained NERF model, which has actually, remember, we don't use color, we use geometry. So the translation goes from the middle column to the right column. Sorry, I just want to be completely clear. But we can now use NERF to go from this representation of color to this representation of geometry. And these understanding of 3D geometry can then be used to understand the content of a scene, right? All right. And so now you might ask, yeah, this all sounds great, but how many annotations do I actually need? And at least on, uh, on this data set that we tried, the good news is that most of the gains are actually from having a large number of scenes to learn from, right? So as you can see from 10 scenes, you already have a relatively high, surprisingly high, I would say, uh, understanding of the scene already in the high 80s. And as you add more and more scene, it starts to saturate. This is the relatively simple data set used for ablations, uh, but I believe these findings will generalize to even in data in the wild now with more modern NERF models. And so having a lot of scenes is great. Also, having a lot of scenes is not a lot of work because each new scene takes a couple of minutes nowadays to optimize via NERF. And these scenes can be acquired by things like autonomous cars, robots, drones, whatever you want to use, right? And having a large number of scenes is actually what's important. And the other bit of this plot that I want you to focus on is this gap right here, right? So if you notice, I'm zooming in, but the gap in between the blue bar and the orange one is actually not that much. It's only about two or three points percentage, right? It's, we're a year in between 90 and 100. So yeah, do the math in relatives. It's, it's a few points. And this uh, uh, upward trend uh, curve is actually a bit misleading. But the idea is that to achieve this performance, you don't need a lot of images. 
And actually, with even just a single annotated image of an entire scene, so the scene might have hundreds of images, right, to build the nerve model, but at training time, I only annotate one of them. And as you can see, this is sufficient to actually train a very good, a very high quality understanding of the underlying 3D scene. So this will be like a 10% uh, annotation of my input data. This will be, you know, uh, one 25% uh, of, of that, right? Just to give you an idea. So, and this is very good news because it means that we can leverage um, sparse 2D annotations to train dense 3D annotation, 3D uh, understanding models. And this is also great going back, remember a few seconds ago that I mentioned that we wanted to do understanding from the geometry, not from the color point of view because the color bit is covered by semantic nerve, right? So, yeah, I have to wait for this to stop pulsing. And the good news is that uh, you can actually try to do an adversarial attack to your model, right? So here, that's exactly what we did. Uh, we did a adversarial attack on image-based models. And by the way, the reason for which these adversarial attacks are relevant, you can see right here, right? Um, it's scary to have autonomous agents that rely on single image observation of the environment or perhaps video to understand the 3D content of a scene, right? Because you can fool somebody in believing, in letting them believe that the scene contains something else with something like that. And there's no way to understand that that's uh, a malicious or non malicious outcome. So, what you were showing right here is that we can show that despite the fact that we train our model with images that belong to a certain distribution, and then we test our model with out of distribution signal, in this case, as you can see, for example, the model was trained with the blue scenes but the color of the object at test time were completely randomized, right? And what I'm showing you right here is that the performance both in 2D and 3D is basically completely stable versus you tend to have collapse in performance in image-based models because they need augmentation to be able to deal with this kind of, um, this kind of models right here or this kind of uh, adversarial attacks right here, sorry. All right, so there was actually one mistake that I believe that we did in uh, in uh, in and in, in ESF uh, back in the days, but this was actually because at the time I didn't have a ultra deep understanding of the volume rendering mathematics of NERF. And what we did, remember, we did a mapping in between the density model of a NERF and the semantic class of a NERF. Uh, but recently, uh, while working with Lily on on NERF to NERF. Um, I took my time uh, with Ben to kind of like dig deeper within the nerve math. And actually this volume rendering digest um, technical report uh, contains the summary of those findings. And the main outcome of that is that um, imagine you have a simple scene like you see right here, the content of a nerve scene is not in the density of the model. The geometric understanding, geometric understanding of a nerve scene is in the transmittance of a model. And in particular, the derivative of the transmittance gives you the likelihood of a point belonging to a surface. And so if you want to know more, a little bit more about this, if I were to go back and, and redo an ESF, I will base it over the derivative of the transmittance function. And if you want to know more, we talk about surface fields in the nerve to nerve paper. So I invite you to, to take a look at it. Um, that's how I will redo that just to fix uh, past mistakes. And I want to conclude and, and leave a little bit uh, time for questions at the end um, and just go back to the premise of the entire talk, right? So we want to go beyond the novel view synthesis. We want to use NERF and novel view synthesis as a way of understanding the environment around us, just like our eye allow it to understand the 3D scene before we perform an action. So my question is, or one of my missions for my research group is developing the geometry processing toolbox of neural fields, right? So often geometry processing refers to polygonal meshes. I think that we can move now beyond that because geometry processing can be just thought of being understanding of geometry as captured by images. And in doing that, I would just recommend generally um, for faster adoption in particular, to try to think of ways of merging classical techniques from the classical geometry toolbox to uh, neural fields for faster adoption. And finally, I think one of the most important objectives for the next uh, two or three years will be to actually the creation of large scale sets for 3D understanding, right? So I think this would be one of the critical uh, missions that um, somebody within the academic community or in the industrial community will have to tackle. 
And just to give you an idea that I'm not um, just, these are not empty words. And uh, this is the North, North paper. You can see it, uh, the project page right here. And what we did, the idea behind this paper was to generalize one of the most classical operations in uh, geometry processing, which was pairwise alignment. So if you have heard of ICP or RANSAC, uh, to the domain of neural fields. And here actually you can see it working using a little bit of the math that I mentioned a couple of seconds ago in terms of the surface field. And with that, I would like to conclude and thank you my many collaborators. Uh, this is as much time as I had to uh, fetch their photos uh, from the internet and paste them here. This is by far not uh, an exhaustive list. And I would like to thank uh, Matthias for the invite. It was a pleasure to talk to myself for an hour and uh, have a few minutes for questions. Cool, thanks a lot. Um, do we have questions? Maybe I can start with one question. Um, so, I mean, you mentioned a lot. How do you see in the future, maybe a high level question, right? How do you see in the future the, the relationship between neural fields and geometry? Like, I mean, you, you highlighted a little bit, like, what's going to be the case? Are we going to do everything as a neural field? Do we always still have to go back to meshes? What's your gut feeling? What's going to happen in, like, in real world applications outside of academia? So that's actually a question. So if you look back at the progress of vision, machine learning, graphics, uh, it's actually tied to hardware, right? So the answer to the question is, is not really up to the practitioner, like to us, whether we're going to be able to use uh, um, polygonal meshes-based technology or neural fields-based technology. It's a matter of whether that the hardware to support more general operations will be available at the consumer level. Right. So if you're telling me that, for example, a chip to evaluate neural fields will be in the hands of every person within, let's say, five to 10 years, then we're going to move completely to just work on neural fields because using polygonal meshes will kind of not make any sense. And all of the hardware will come together with it. So I think that the, the answer to the question is, I don't know. And it depends whether we're successful in convincing hardware vendor that is critical to what I need. Uh, but I think that most likely what will happen is that we will have hybrid representations because we are going to have 30 years of technological baggage to transfer. So hopefully uh, we're going to move away from these, um, I don't want to use, I don't want to be too critical, but these difficult to use uh, discrete data structures, which are really painful to code in and move more toward these continuous representations. Uh, and those make me very happy because in, it relates to my continuous math background in engineering and I don't have to worry about <laughs> discrete entities, but I, I, I cannot predict it. And so right now I dip my feet in both sides, right? Carefully dipping and, and try to straddle the realm of, of geometry processing and the one of neural fields. I think I could have rephrased the question also and said, well, is there a fundamental limitation to make hardware of neural fields as efficient as let's say rasterization, scan line, stuff like this, right? And you look at it, I don't know, it's not so clear. It's, it's not so clear, yeah. It's not so Once easy, you right? have, uh, Yeah. Um, ooh, any other questions? Yeah, I would have a question towards the Mobile North paper. So thanks for the cool talk. While I was reading the paper, I was just curious about the training procedure there. So if I understand correctly, it's a training procedure taking multiple hours with the MLP-based NERF approach? Sure. Do you think there's a fundamental, um, it, it, should it also be possible with the voxel grid-based hybrid representations to train it within minutes? Yes, uh, the short answer to that question is Jichin preferred to have um, higher peak SNR rather than smaller training time. Um, that's it. You can take that paper and then just convert it to an instant NGP backbone, and you will have a slightly lower peak SNR, and it will still work. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's the yeah. purely whether you prioritize impact in industry versus impact in academia, right? It's just, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. OK, yeah, thanks. So I have a similar question then. You said uh, you used a very outdated technique to generate your neural fields, um, yeah. probably the classical nerve. And then if I understand you correctly, you're basically saying, okay, if I want to have high quality neural fields, I'll just, for the most P PSNR, I'll use the nerve 360. And otherwise I have the instant NGP if I prioritize speed. Yeah, although, I mean, like if you have been following what has been happening on the soft, open source software side of things recently, 
Um, there is many libraries that offer performance that is basically basically just as good as MIPNERF 360, but are not MIPNERF 360 based, like right? the NERF Studio stuff from Angju's group uh, at Berkeley. Um, yeah, my postdoc is telling me that there is things in there that are not published yet, and they they actually produce higher PKSNR that that mean RFT sixty. So, yeah, I don't I don't worry about that. the 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 field will catch up and provide better software. The question is, we're doing computer vision, right? So, generating a nerve scene is computer graphics, not computer vision. So, I want to move on to the next step, and I know somebody will work in improving these models more and more, right? So, we could rerun all of the experiments that we had for NESF. And they will just look better. And I could also do it on natural scenes, uh, which I'm planning to do actually with, with Suhani right now. That's what we're working on. And then another question. So in urban radiance fields, I think it's also from, from you, right? Um, you have a multi-modal data. So like depth, for example. That's right. Um, is that a better way or an alternative way of generating these neural fields? Because I mean, in principle, we're just trying to create a high quality neural field, right? That's and right. then if we have maybe multimodal data, then maybe we get a better quality field. That's right. So the um, historical for urban radiance fields was that the sampling rate, the temporal sampling of cameras in a Google Street View backpack is relatively low. And so if you try to train uh, a NERF model from a low frame rate, Basically, there's not enough frames to build really high quality um, models. And so you already have, in that case, right, these backpacks are equipped with both 360 cameras as well as with LiDAR sensors. And what it turns out to be is that geometry acquired by whatever source provides actually a very strong supervision signal for, for NERF models. And so by compounding um, photometric reconstruction together with more geometric sources, the, the train loops become a lot faster to converge and they produce a lot better results. And the reason is due to the null space of NERF, right? Remember, there's nothing that tells NERF, like a NERF training workload, that they shouldn't put uh, a plane epsilon away from the camera, infinitesimally small away epsilon away from the camera, and then just memorize the appearance of that image in that flat space, right? And so having this external source of supervision basically give you a clean grounding to your reconstructed NERF model, where you say, look, I have line of sight. This is a LiDAR measurement. It's extremely high fidelity that in between this point, the, the camera origin, and this point in space, there is absolutely nothing because my LiDAR over and over has confirmed that that measurement should be trusted. And so I think it's actually important to compound um, these different worlds, especially because we have them, right? Like, I mean, like the, the iPad Pro and the iPhone, I don't know, I'm... I don't buy the latest one, but the latest iPhones have, uh, have uh, a LiDAR sensor in it. So why not use it? It's in the hands of millions of people. Why should I throw away that data, right? And from a technical point of view, using geometry lowers the number of images that you need on the, on the photometric, like by an order of magnitude, right? So that's basically what it does. Yeah, I think Tada, you had a question. You should probably just unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I have a question regarding the probing. So you mentioned you are using uh, some kind of regular grid, right? Regular dense grid. So my question is, would it be like, would it improve the model if we use some kind of sparse or maybe adaptive grid, like let's say, Absolutely. or or maybe it's, it's just complicate the model and that complication is, is not worth, what do you think? So, Remember earlier when I told you that some of the decisions in design of stuff are due by hardware? Um, at Google, we have a lot of, at the time, we had a lot of TPUs available to us uh, and not so many GPUs. And coding CUDA kernels tends to be a little bit more painful than, than, um, than elsewhere. And so what we did is uh, um, we implemented the fastest, um, the simplest 3D reasoning network that we could in JAX because no implementation existed. And that was a, a 3D unit. Uh, absolutely. If uh, I was in PyTorch and using NVIDIA GPUs, uh, that would have not been a dense grid of densities, but it would have been something something different. So something for us, perhaps where samples were drawn proportional to the likelihood of a point having high density. Yeah. Yeah, that totally makes so sense. Yeah. yeah. 
And That's... I remember, like, I was not joking when I said that we we did the simplest choice. Uh, oh, this animation. We did the simplest choice in, in each of these points, right? Like, you can take either of these three points and write a paper about it. Mm -hmm. So there is better ways of uh, generating a function than this. There is better ways of reasoning about functions than that. And there is better ways of doing regular sampling. Like, there is a paper from Polina Golan's group for example, about the point number one already a few months after we sent NESF to archive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get it. Thanks. Cool, thanks. Any, any last question? Yeah, I would, if you don't mind, follow up again on the motor model question. Have you um, tried to incorporate normals and not just depth? Because, I mean, depth is like a super good supervision signal, um, especially to ground your geometry. But, um, you know, it, maybe normals can also benefit. And I mean, yeah, yeah. have you, have you played Not around? Not me, but uh, it's actually one of the paper that I'm most excited uh, about. Uh, Mononerf and uh, Neuris. Oh, now my memory uh, is, is, is fading. But there is a paper from uh, Song Yu Peng and other colleagues uh, at Tübingen, as well as one from Christian Teobald's group. Both of them use normal supervision, and one of them uses also that. But normal supervision is basically yeah, them. the auto ref does use it, which is super exciting. But they use it for geometry, which is interesting. So they don't use it for the for the nerve stuff, right? I mean, so they use it for a nerve, but they use it for the, the Goldricks to get high geometry. The question is, does it help the, the RGP as well? That would be interesting. I don't that one I haven't seen yet. Yeah, I would assume. I mean, there's. Yeah, I mean, as soon as you don't get the geometry wrong, as soon as you get the geometry wrong, all sort of kind of funky things happen to the to the appearance level as well, right? Because uh, I don't know if you've ever played around with one of these, uh, let's say, badly trained nerf model. Um, the typical failure mode is that view dependent effect get memorized as substrate volume, right? So you have volumes built built within the volume, like behind the surfaces that hallucinate the appearance of things. And sometimes this is good, right? Like this is how mobile nerve cheats and shows you volumetric effects. Uh, so it's abused by mobile nerve in the form, right? But in other, in other representation where you have a hard surface, for example, you don't want that to appear ever. And so the question becomes, how do you prevent that from happening? And- uh, Right, but what's still interesting is, so if you take any of the nerve methods that focus on geometry reconstruction, their P's and R's are significantly worse. That's right. Right. And the argument is so cheating to cheating in a sense to some degree helps you with the visual re-rendering. That's right. And, um, and when I, when you mean that, you mean like papers that use SDFs, right? Well, SDFs or occupancy mm -hmm. or something like this, right? I mean this. Um, yeah, and that's exactly what I mean by this point. What is it? Here. This is geometry. Right. This peak of likelihood in the derivative of the transmittance function is geometry. You don't need an SDF to represent geometry. This is the only thing that you need. And just like, uh, how do I go back to a slide that was like half an age ago? Let's move really fast. But these uh, imposes priors on geometry without imposing a strict model on the underlying density, right? Without forcing the model to be. And so I think there is other ways. I completely agree with you, Matthias. Um, we don't have to force the model, twist its arm into having a behavior to promote that behavior. And I think that that's why the PKSNR is a bit slower, lower. Right. But it's still interesting, right? I mean, because you would have argued, like, I mean, a by argument, right? I mean, if you basically have no good geometry, yep. like, I'm, I'm not talking about overfitting and stuff like this, right? I'm talking about generalization to novel views and ideally with as few as possible. So you would argue, well, in order to get this right, you have to get the full physical 3D representation right, meaning you need good geometry. But this is a little bit, in a sense, it's counterintuitive. And I mean, why, I know why it's happening because you run out of capacity, right? It, it just has a different optimization and a forcing function right now. Um, I don't know if it's a capacity problem or it's an alt space problem where you have a, an, an unconvex optimization and just fall into the wrong minima and then you're stuck. I, I'm, my assumption is actually is is, uh, is more about, yeah, it's it's an unconstrained optimization problem and you just, if you don't have enough priors, it's just easy to fall into the wrong local minima. And many, there is many other failures mode of nerve which are caused by early, um, how do you say, early failure modes of density. Like for example, as soon as you have cause occlusion within the system where that 
the ray dies basically it never sends gradients back to other parts of the scene it's very hard to get out of the mode, right right but you could so what you just said is you could easily debug like my versus your argument you could go ahead and say do a network that has two heads one predicts right. STF, right one predicts rgb and then you can see yeah. like what would happen in this case and that's why i mean mobile that's by the way um oops i don't even know what it is so that's exactly what mobile i didn't go into the details but the, the internals right. of this model do exactly that there is split heads and this makes sense and i think this makes a lot of sense actually i think it's a very smart decision what you guys did there but i but yeah. I, I, yeah. I guess i'm arguing sorry go ahead and i completely agree with you because i i think of memorizing a texture within a volume just being a volumetric texture right and the only thing that i have to do is that i have to remember the values of the volumetric texture in space and there is no need to correlate that with the structure of the geometry. So this is actually, we've been going back and forth on it. Um, and I'm trying to understand better the trade-off in between having split heads versus um, these branch off heads. So, so, our experience was, so, so our experience was whenever we did split heads, what happened is the network just split the capacity and learned two independent stuff. So there was, when we, when we had two MLPs, there was little to no, um, little to no shared signal basically. Like in a sense, you would expect that there's some joint feature learning and stuff like this going on. Like for confidence, we always had that. This was great when you did like multitask training and stuff like this. But but for neural fields, we never had this. They just were completely independent networks and they had very little to do with each other. Yeah. And and you can test this, right? For instance, you have a network like this, like one of them encodes um, geometry that have an RGB and then you fit it to a point cloud, then you would expect that the RGB is also reasonable, but it isn't, right? You just get random stuff. That's um, right. I mean, the question is like, uh, it wouldn't make sense if there is correlation in between density and appearance, right? But is there? Like, there's not, right? Like, why, why there has to be correlation in between this? There's, other than the location in space where you have something there or not, that's the only correlation that exists, right? When you have a high density, then you're likely to have to use a value stored at that position in space. So the only correlation is in terms of spatial information density, but not in the content of the signal. And so actually that's the only way in which I can kind of explain why sometimes it's still better to have these branch off structures, but I have not, I've, this has not been one of my, my high I pressing. Think, I think, so this is something we have tried. We've tried the signal that clearly has a correlation, yeah. but the MLP could not exploit it. Or at least we didn't know what to do. Like we didn't get this to work, right? It was kind of interesting. So even if you have a signal that is actually supposed to have some, some correlation, like the, the neural fields having real trouble to do that. Like they can't do it. So the thing from a from a pure representation standpoint and how you optimize it, I feel this is something we should probably look into it more as a community. Like there's, yeah, not, there's not so much work there yet, right? Yeah, and yet uh, but uh, many people with strong opinions against it. And uh, um, yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't, <laughs> no, I love it actually. I mean, it's a really cool area. I mean, you can do a lot of cool stuff with it right now. Yeah, no, no, no. What I mean is that I tried uh, to to push people to split them, but then I had some some pushback. <laughs> That's what I meant. <laughs> cool. All right. uh, I, don't, I don't see a reason for them to having to go to. I mean, it's the same thing as ge it's actually this image explains it really well, right? Because this is geometry, this is texture, and in classical pipelines, they're just represented by different things with an right. interaction in between the two, which tells you where to fetch which one when, and they're. They have no correlation. I can take a mesh and I can reskin it with a new texture, and it's fine. And it's actually important that they're uncorrelated. So yeah, I, I agree with you. So I'm just uh, I'm just resonating with what you're saying. Cool. Oh, actually, I think we're running a little bit out of time. Actually, I don't think we can take many more questions. Um, so I guess yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot, Andrea, for for a really cool talk. Um, I I hope. Yeah, I think this was super inspiring, at least to me. Like for me, this is always super exciting to listen to your talks. Um, I hope to see you at the next conferences and I, I obviously hope to see more and more cool research coming out of it. Um, and otherwise, thanks everybody else for joining. And if you come by Vancouver, just feel free to knock my door and uh, come give a talk. Not just you, Matthias, but other people also in the in the room. Yeah, sorry, I just ended it.